Welcome. Hello and welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University, uh, hosted by the Transportation Research and Education Center. Uh, my name is Chris Munsier. I'm a professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and together with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Jenny Liu in Urban Studies and Planning, uh, we are the instructors for this uh, class this quarter and the, and the moderators for the session today. Um, so, uh, Portland State University campus is open for in-person uh, classes this fall, uh, but we made the uh, decision to offer this class uh, in the online format uh, again. Um, so the Friday transportation seminars have been a tradition at Portland State since 2000. These seminars are uh, usually held on the campus, but we're hosting them online. Uh, and the PSU's campus is located on the ancestral lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet and Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watala bands of the Chinook and the Tualatin, Kala, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of their sacrifices forged on the indigenous ancestors uh, of this place. Remember these communities and honor their legacies and descendants. Uh, today, we're very pleased uh, to have Adam Millard Ball presenting on Turning Streets into Housing. Uh, Adam is an associate professor in the Department of Urban Planning at UCLA, focusing on transportation and climate change. Before joining UCLA, he taught environmental studies at UC Santa Cruz and was a principal with the transportation planning firm Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates. He holds a PhD in environment and resources from Stanford University. Before we uh, jump into the rest of the seminar to give you a preview of uh, the upcoming seminars and uh, 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 we will have uh, next week, uh, myself and Sarisha Koturi and Dave, David Hurwitz from Oregon State will be presenting on bicycle detection, confirmation and countdown devices. Um, and then the, the three other upcoming seminars are, are, sh are shown there. Um, attending this seminar on the Zoom webinar, uh, everybody should be well practiced in, in, in Zoom, um, but you can expect the presentation to last about 30 minutes followed by uh, Q&A. And to type in questions uh, on your Zoom control panel, use the, the Q&A Q box, and then Professor Liu and I will moderate those questions and, and ask. If we don't have time for all of the questions, uh, we will email those to the speaker and uh, perhaps he will be able to respond to those directly. Uh, one other thing to note before I hand it over, the students who are registered in the class for credit, you should have uh, read the syllabus um, and uh, watched the video that Professor Liu and I posted on, on sort of what the the requirements for the class in terms of what you need to turn in and the due dates. And then we will be hosting a short Zoom Q&A at the conclusion of the seminar on another Zoom link that's posted in the D2L link. And I'll chat that at the end of the seminar. So with that, I am going to uh, stop my screen share, turn it over to Adam and mute myself. So welcome Adam and the floor is yours. Great, hey, thanks so much. And it's really nice to be with you virtually. Thank you for the invitation. And hopefully one day in the future, we'll be able to do these things um, back in, um, in person again. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is some work on turning streets into housing. And because living on the streets is typically synonymous with homelessness. So if you, and the most obvious is these types of tent cities or other makeshift encampments. Um, but there are also many people who live on the streets in cars and camper vans, often a little less visibly, and um, sometimes even old school buses. And what I really want to try and convince you of today is that there's actually nothing inherently wrong with living on the street. Um, because streets provide the larger reservoir of public land in most cities. And a lot of that land is surplus to transportation requirements. And so some of that land can and should be used to, to house and shelter unhoused people and provide a wide pool of um, low cost housing. 
So rather that the problem isn't with using streets for housing, it's with the lack of services and support for people who live on the streets right now, and harassment, um, sometimes by police and local residents. Um, so in essence, in essence, rather than trying to evict people from the streets, I want to argue that cities should try and find ways to turn these streets into adequate housing. So that's what I'll be talking about for the next um, 30 minutes. But before we get to the housing on the streets, I want to raise a, a more fundamental question about how wide a street should be. We can try and answer that question if we think about the different functions of streets. Um, so most obviously access. If you can't get to a piece of residential land, then that land basically has no value. And so access for a, a moving truck, as shown here, um, garbage, um, um, driving up, walking up, but biking up. Um, all these are really critical functions of the, the street. It doesn't have to be a, a regular street. Um, it could be a shared surface, the type of wuna for shared space, um, the, the typical in the, in the Netherlands. And it doesn't need to be that wide. Um, about 16 feet is all that's really needed for the right of way for access alone. And that's what the um, um, Ashto, one of the, um, the, 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 the traffic engineering um, bodies, um, advises as a minimum width for an alley. So alleys also provide um, access to, um, to, to different parcels. There's also movement. And certainly for arterials is a different question. I'm not really talking about that, that here. But on most residential streets, there's very little traffic. It's just people who are living in that neighborhood. Um, there's, there's no through, through movement um, function. And here, just a, a single lane works perfectly fine. Um, a year street where, hey, if you're, you're coming along and someone's coming in the other direction, then you just figure it out. You back up or you pull into a, a driveway to let the other one pass. This works really well, um, including in cities in the, um, in, in the US. And for that bi-directional lane, you only need about 12 feet. And that can be the same 16 feet, uh, within the same 16 feet that's required for, um, for, for access. Uh, so we're still only at a 16 foot wide street right of way that is needed. Certainly storage is another useful function of the residential street. Um, On-street parking is useful, um, but it's almost always oversupplied. Um, particularly in suburban areas. Um, I can't remember the last time I saw a suburban residential street where there wasn't acres of empty parking spaces. Um, and so the marginal value is typically zero. If you, if I try and, I, I live in um, a, a, a suburban neighborhood, and if I tried to post on Craigslist to try and rent out my off-street parking space, people would just laugh at me, like, why should I pay anything? There's, there's a value of zero. There's so much parking available in the, in the neighborhood. And even if, I'm not saying that no on-street parking is required, but just that there is too much of it at present. And that means that we don't need to have a continuous parking lane. The street can just widen out occasionally to provide pockets of, um, of parking. And there's certainly many other functions of a street, light, air, space, um, for landscaping, um, social functions, but this doesn't typically need any extra width. It can still be accommodated within that same um, 16 feet. So all that is to say that most residential streets don't need to be wider than 16 feet. And that's the entire right of way, not just the, um, the, the street surface. Um, and there's many examples of this um, worldwide. Uh, the the Woonas that I mentioned, these kind of shared spaces, um, um, typical in the Netherlands, um, um, also used in places like the, the UK. Um, these are a little wider, these examples, but they don't need to be wider than 16 feet. In major cities like Tokyo, even in newly constructed neighborhoods, the average street is only 16 feet wide. 
And this is a pretty typical um, um, mixed use um, neighborhood street in Tokyo. Sure, motor vehicles can get access if you need deliveries or if you need to, to drive up or for people with disabilities, um, but the street in general is pedestrian scaled. Even in San Francisco, um, this is the McCondry Lane um, that's popularized in the, the novel um, Tales of the, um, the, the City. This is just a stairway. This isn't even close to 16 feet wide. And these houses still go for millions of dollars. People are quite happy to live on a street, but it's not even a street. The only access is by staircase. So how do streets right now actually stack up with that? How, how wide are they? Well, typically city standards aren't even close to 16 um, feet. These are a couple of examples of even relatively um, re recent street design manuals that are incorporated into so subdivision code. This is San Jose on the left. Even the, the narrow residential isn't really that narrow. It's 40 or even 48 feet um, wide. And more typically, the kind of minor residential, 50 or even 60 feet wide. Why on earth do you need 60 feet of right of way for a self described minor residential um, street? And um, this is the um, City of San Diego Street de um, Design Manual, even for a low volume um, residential local street. So even the traffic engineers are saying, look, we're not going to have much, if any, traffic um, here. They're talking about a, a 58 to 62 foot right of way. Oops. Um, and US streets, as a result, are some of the widest in the, the, the world. Um, so this is data from the Atlas of Urban Expansion. Each of these bars is a city in the data set, um, and then the average width of the, the right of way. So there's one city here that's just over 10 feet wide on average. Um, but the, 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 but in, in terms of outside of the US, more typical is just over 20 or about 25 feet wide, the non-US city mean. These are US cities on, on the right. Again, each bar is a city in their, their data set. And the average is close to 40 feet. And there's some cities, I think this is um, um, somewhere in Ohio, um, it's almost 70 feet wide on average uh, for streets in the, in the city. And my own um, data, this is recently published in, um, in JAPA. Um, show that this these whips can directly be traced to subdivision rules. So that there's the traffic engineering um, standards that are reflected in subdivision ordinances to, to lay out new neighborhoods. So this peaks here. This is a, these are histograms of the distribution of, of street whips. And Maricopa County, this is basically city of Phoenix in Arizona. It's a really extreme example. Virtually every residential street that's built in that county is exactly 50 feet um, wide. And this is in a case where like the developers get to say, well, sometimes the residents might prefer a wider street. Sometimes perhaps we have geographic constraints. Let's build a narrower street. No, they are following the subdivision codes to the, to, to, to the letter. Um, San Bernardino is an example where they're also following the codes to the letter. Um, but the subdivision code perhaps has different standards for different types of streets. So we have some 40, some 50, but most of these residential streets are 60. And this is residential streets only. This is not taking account of arterials um, 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 or, or, commercial, um, or commercial streets. And sometimes this is completely, um, these are arbitrary, but sometimes it's even more arbitrary. So in Chicago, there's a 66 foot right of way um, rule for, for, for new streets. Why? Well, because when the city was established, the surveyor's chain was 60 foot. And so they used that to lay out the subdivisions. And now, I mean, hopefully they've moved beyond surveying with this physical chain, but they've still kept that 66 foot standard for new street rights of way in place. So why do we care? Um, well, there's lots of of um, challenges with wide um, streets, including traffic safety, um, urban heat, and so on. The one I want to focus here is on the cost. So this is unfortunately a pretty typical house in San Jose right now, going for nearly um, $3 million. 
Um, and the street right of way outside this house is 100 feet wide. So remember, we only need 16 feet for, for, for access. So most of this street is completely unnecessary. Again, one of the, why do we care? Well, we care because of the cost. But you're paying $3 million, give or take, for this house, but you're also paying $220,000 just for the land value of the street outside your house. Um, so if we were using this for housing, um, this land would be, under street would be worth $220,000. Um, but it's basically worth nothing under streets, at least at the margin, there's useless asphalt, the parking is rarely or never um, fully occupied. And so how does this cost actually translate into housing prices? Well, there's two channels here. First of all, it's just this land cost um, that's added to the, um, the, the, the cost for developers, also the infrastructure of pouring asphalt and building curbs and so on. But then also constraining supply. And there's a large literature that talks about how um, kind of region-wide supply constraints, often from exclusionary zoning, push up the price of housing, and as such are a, a, a key cause of housing and affordability, and affordability um, and homelessness in many US cities. To put it another way, um, this is the per square foot value that um, each of these that land and different uses have. The housing bit, $133 a square foot. The street right of way, well, you're not charged anything for it. And the city gives us away for free. And the city almost gives a parking away for free. You can argue, well, if you need a residential permit and you amortize that, that's about $4 um, a, a square foot. The point here, there's a massive disconnect between the value and both in terms of the price we pay, but also the value that people place on this land um, for housing and the value of land under streets. So what can we do about it? Like, is there a way to turn these streets into housing? I want to first acknowledge that, well, this is something that is already happening. Like people are using streets as their homes. Um, this is an example from LA, again, a multi-million dollar house in, um, in Melrose um, with a camper van parked outside. Um, this is also evident in this um, um, you know, novel and movie from um, starring Dame Maggie Smith about uh, Miss Shepherd, who lived on the streets for many, many um, years in London. And let me just play a little clip from a trailer. Last year she was in Gloucester Avenue, now it's our turn. Were you planning on staying long? Mr. Baggett, the ideal would be off-street parking. We were just saying how grateful she'll be. Yes. <laughs> Put the van in your drive. Just till you sort yourself out. Merry Christmas! So she stayed there for 15 years, partly on the street and then partly in a friendly um, neighbor's driveway. And that's, that's a true story. It's a dr dramatized um, in, in, in the movie there. And I want to take a little aside and think about how this line between land for streets and land for housing might be blurred even more in a future if and when autonomous vehicles become commonplace. And in some of my previous work, I show how the rational decision for autonomous cars may be, hey, like, why should I pay $2 an hour or more for parking when I can just cruise around? And so some of this, the simulations, they show that autonomous vehicles can take their own, create their own traffic, this lazy river of cars where they just drive around really slowly, killing time. And this costs them to, quote unquote, park um, less than 50 cents an hour. So in this way, autonomous vehicles uh, may be able to blur the line um, between land for parking and land for streets. 
Now, autonomous camper vans or RVs, um, such as these um, concepts, uh, concept models here, take that a step further. They don't just blur the land between land for parking and land for streets or street for movement, but also between those and the land for housing. And cities often have anti-camping restrictions. They use uh, parking time limits or overnight parking restrictions to um, stop unhoused people um, using the, the, the streets in this way. But for an autonomous camper van, if and when they become a reality, it becomes very, pretty easy to get around. You can tell your camper van to just move every hour if it needs, or just creep around really slowly during the midnight hours. And that's really difficult to, to, to regulate um, around unless a city wants to ban camper vans all, altogether. So what does this mean in terms of what cities can do right now? Well, the simplest way is to formalize what is happening already and just legalize van living. Um, places like Berkeley, they have already introduced safe parking zones um, for off-street sites, um, typically overnight only. But there's not many places where a city can do this. Um, so these don't typically have a large number of spare pieces of vacant land that are, are lying around, at least off the streets. But streets are a really large source of surplus land. Um, so cities could lease out these street spaces for a nominal fee um, and provide services, um, some sanitation, water, perhaps power, um, garbage collection, and so on. And most importantly, provide some security of tenure, uh, which allows people to, to, to stay there for longer, to develop some social um, norms and community, um, and um, avoid many of the, 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 the challenges from when it's a, you have a new neighbor every, every day or two. Um, this could be vans, it could even be tiny houses um, in the street right of way. Cities could also permit private resident, private homeowners to do this in their driveways. So permit um, van living or this type of mobile tiny house in the, the driveway. Um, and the key is to move beyond the kind of tolerance, like blind eye, but occasional crackdowns um, strategy, which some cities have used, and think of this as a, a actually active policy to provide more housing options. And there's an analogy here um, with canals, which are another piece of surplus transportation infrastructure um, in places like the UK. Um, where more and more people are choosing to live on canal boats. And this image here is from, from, from London, where, okay, it's not free, but it's a, a typically a much more affordable source of housing um, than renting an apartment in high-cost cities like London or in, in, in Oxford. So we can think of streets as the new canals. Um, we don't need all of this street space anymore for, for, for transportation. And so this is some um, artistic renderings by my colleague Aaron Single. You can think of the canal boat analogy as directly translating into camper van living, um, the same sort of personalization of space and community um, facilities that, um, that, that sort of security of tenure entails. Um, canal boat moorings, um, okay, some people are more nomadic, but some moorings are let out at least by for a year or more by the city council. Why not do the same for camper vans? In the long term, of course, just reducing the excessive nature of street whip standards is, um, is also important for, for cities to, to do. Um, narrow streets like, like this one in, um, in Harrisburg um, work perfectly well. And the, the value of the land is much greater under housing than under streets. So cities could certainly reduce the minimum street widths um, in new development, or even abolish them altogether and leave it to the developers to figure out what's the balance between using land for streets and land for housing. Um, there's no wider citywide benefit in most case to a wide street for movement. The benefits typically accrue just to the local property owners. So there's an argument there to let the developers decide. And if you think this is a giveaway to developers, well then ask for other more useful public benefits, uh, perhaps some land set aside for conservation um, or a 
greater share of inclusionary housing units um, instead of wider streets. But that's for new development. What about the existing urban fabric, which is certainly much more challenging to transform? Well, here we can think about expanding existing residential lots into the right of way, and perhaps in conjunction with a, a wider redevelopment, perhaps um, and building um, triplex or, or other multifamily housing. But simpler is just to expand the, the lot into the right of way to create space for an accessory dwelling unit in the front yard. And here it's a kind of courtyard style of development. And so that expanding the lot into the right of way creates a space for this to happen. And when you think, well, the front yard might provide some benefits in terms of privacy, landscaping, having a front yard. Um, well, that function can be assumed by the former street. And then this approach also avoids complications if there's sewers or other utilities that are running under the, the, the sidewalk. There's a precedent for this, just in reverse. Developers often are asked to seed bits of their property um, if they want to, to, to build a new project, to widen, quote unquote, substandard streets. So why not do it the other way around? Narrow streets in conjunction with development rather than widen them. And here's an example of how this might happen. Again, a pretty typical lot in um, suburban lot in, um, in, in city of San Jose in, in, in California. And um, what can we do? Well, we could um, create these, these dark gray and new accessory dwelling units. Um, some of them are conversions of existing garages. Um, sometimes the, the landowner might want to replace it in a new garage. Sometimes they might say, well, we can just park on the street um, instead. So use the existing front yards and either through new units or through garage conversions to create a bunch of new housing. And then expand the lot into the right of way to provide pockets for parking, um, landscaping and other functions. This is the same idea in, in cross section, that this is the existing property line from and the street right of way from, from here to here. So a space for new ADUs in what is now the front setback. Then the former street away, street right away, right now at 60 feet, reducing it to 20 feet, leaves a lot of space for landscaping, pockets of, of um, on-street shared parking, um, and, and, and so on. So to wrap up, in most cases, there's not a great argument for a residential street to be more than 16 feet wide especially if there's a shared surface without curbs for, 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 for sidewalks. And this typical street width for 50 feet or wider on US streets is a direct cause of some of the exorbitant housing costs we see in, um, in particularly in, um, in the coasts in Oregon and California um, and on the East Coast as, as well. So what do we do about it? Well, there's three ways in which I propose we can start to turn these streets into housing. First of all, to formalize, legalize um, camper van living or tiny house living in the street right of way. Second, more for the long term, for new development to reduce or even eliminate requirements for minimum street widths. And then third, to allow um, homeowners to extend their lots into the, the streets. And the bigger point here is, I think there's been this siloed mentality among um, planners and engineers, but there's something special about land under streets, that this is sacrosanct. It can only be used for transportation purposes, but there's something special about a street. But really, land is just land, right? It's a, a piece of the Earth's surface. And there's no good reason to keep this siloed mentality about what land should be for transportation and what land should be for urban, other urban functions. And actually started to push the boundaries of that a little bit with COVID, with kind of expansion of parklets and outdoor dining, but only on the commercial front, not really on the housing front. So rethinking this artificial divide between um, land for streets and um, land for housing is really critical, um, especially in places where street space is really going to waste and housing is unaffordable at the same time. So the concluding thought I'll leave you with is that 
rather than using the police and the other apparatus of the state to stop unhoused people from occupying municipal land, and perhaps cities might think more deeply about how they can turn streets into housing. Um, so thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to, to thank my, my funders through the um, UCITS and for Aaron Singh for the, um, for the art. Um, there's some more of the, the data on streetwebs here at this website, um, streetwebs.its.ucla.edu. Um, you can get in touch with me here. Um, but in the meantime, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Adam, for the presentation. Uh, we're going to move into the Q and A part of the of the of the of the seminar. And just there were a few folks that have typed things into the into the chat. It'll be easier for us to manage it if you use the the Q and A uh, the Q and A feature on the on the Zoom webinar. And so uh, Jenny and I are going to tag team uh, back and forth between these uh, these questions. Um, and let's see, as a civil engineer, I'll pick one from the chat um, in terms of access. So, so Adam says, fire truck access is often given as the reason for requiring wider streets. How can narrower streets safely address emergency vehicle access standards? So it's a great point that, um, that fire chiefs have often been some of the, kind of the biggest proponents of wide streets and the um, one, one of the obstacles to even really modest efforts to, 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 to narrow street rights of, rights of way or even um, lane widths. And, and certainly p politically, um, I'm not kind of underestimating the, the difficulties of bringing the, the fire chiefs on side. Um, but I, the, the two kind of um, practical answers I give to that are, first of all, the US isn't unique in terms of its fires. Like there are really narrow streets other parts of the world and I don't see Tokyo burning down every few days um, to put it facetiously. Um, it, other countries have figured this out with um, smaller equipment, um, the, 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 connect, the connectivity of the streets matters as well and providing multiple routes into uh, a neighborhood. And the US isn't special in any way regarding the physics of fires and emergency vehicle access. Then the other thing I'd say is wide streets are a really, really, really expensive way of having fire safety. And so in some places, um, fire departments have been a little more flexible in exchange for um, perhaps um, residential sprinklers and other um, um, kind of fire prevention measures. But also, perhaps there's a room for developer contributions. Like, if you want to build a fire, uh, 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 narrow street, then there's a, a fee that can buy smaller fire trucks, more agile fire trucks, and vans for local fire departments. I mean, the, the, the sums of money we're just talking about the streets are so staggering that you, you could even buy a fleet of helicopters for, uh, for your local fire department with some of the money that's sitting on, on, on the table here. Um, so the scale of the, the cost of, of wide streets uh, makes it, it's a really expensive way of ensuring fire, um, fire safety. But getting fire chiefs to, to, to the table and to, and to be on board, um, absolutely, that, that's a really tough challenge. Thank you, Adam, for great, really uh, kind of thought-inspiring presentation. Um, I, I think um, the question that I'm going to pose is kind of a combination of a couple of different questions that were along the same lines from the Q&A box as well as the chat. So I think um, a lot of the um, questions were about how to best deal with um, the sewage and water infrastructure, especially um, being that a lot of times that infrastructure exists um, kind of on the side or beneath the sidewalks um, where there's, um, you know, it's more difficult to deal with if there's someone living on top of it, but also um, about adapting those streets to um, an increased capacity of um, sewage and other types of infrastructure. And I know that that tends to be one of the biggest costs in like a lot of our sidewalk widening projects, for example. So just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. 
Right. Um, I think that's the that's a really good point. And that's the reason necessarily not to build directly on the street of, right of way, um, but to build on the front setback. Um, and I mean, to, to my mind, um, I, I'm originally from, from the UK and the US setbacks, especially in the front, seem absurd to, 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 to me, but that's just my design um, predilections. Um, but there's no reason, if you want a wide setback, have that, but on the street right of way, where it's much easier to kind of have access to, uh, if there's just landscaping underneath, then you can dig it up to, to, to have access to water main maintenance and, and so on. And then the only place you're building is on someone's front yard right now. And perhaps in places, that there, there's more flexibility there, like if the, if the lines run in the, the middle of the street, then maybe there's more flexibility um, but in the, the kind of worst case scenario, when it's the sewer and water and other utilities are running under the, the sidewalk, um, then keeping those under um, some sort of landscaping um, would make sure that those can still be main maintained. Um, on really wide streets, um, even creating new parcels in the middle of the street might be might be an option. Um, but again, this is this uh, really context specific design challenges based on the, the, the width and the um, location of these utilities. Um, and then in terms of the capacity of water and sewer, well, that's a challenge with um, building any new housing, right? We can um, kind of throw up our hands and say, yep, yeah, we're, we're, we're closing the, 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 the gates, we're pulling up a drawbridge, um, not intensifying existing urban areas. Or we can um, figure out how to um, c c conserve water um, so that new development is possible. And there's there's so many examples of places that have grown. Even places like Las Vegas have grown immensely, immen immensely, um, while actually reducing their water consumption. In this case, driven by supply constraints. Um, but there's no reason why other places can't fill that um, um, for, follow that lead. And if you're digging up people's front yards to build housing, then that's a lot of water you're saving for landscaping as well. Uh, great. So a question about the pilot or uh, prep the, the sketch you showed in, in, in San Jose. Is that, has that actually been constructed or talks about, about, about actually building that and what, what might you think would be the, the pushback for those types of redevelopments? Um, no, this isn't a, a pilot. These are a kind of concept um, plans that, 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 that we um, developed. And certainly anytime you change a street or a neighborhood, the pushback is from the people who live there. Quite understandably, they, they thought they knew what they were getting into when they moved into the neighborhood. And this is the, the same with any kind of land use change or traffic calming or parking restrictions there's sometimes um, a pushback from the community. And I think the key here is to uh, align people's incentives. So if the people who live on that street actually get a benefit um, out of these changes, then they're more likely to support that. And um, I think we, we see this already with um, in-law units, with um, accessory dwelling units. Um, that even... Um, in California, where I'm most familiar, there's been surprising acceptance of those because people say, yeah, I'd actually could like imagine myself doing this myself. Um, I might want to build an ADU and okay, my, my neighbor might as well. And there might be more people living in this neighborhood. But yeah, hey, I get something out of this as well. And my property value goes up. And so if it's a change that increases someone lots, someone's lot size and they have the potential to um, to expand um, their existing house or build a, a couple of new units, then I think that's a way to get people um, on board um, is to kind of not try and um, be restrictive about what people can do with this extra land. Um, but that might be the price of um, trying to get people to, to, to buy in to this concept. Um, but I think small scale pilots um, are, would be really important in trying to, to show people hey, hey, what this might look like in practice. Thank you. Um, 
I'll um, pose one of the questions uh, by Jesse on, um, on our Q&A saying that um, land um, that is on the street right of way right now is clearly very valuable um, if we converted it to, um, on, to be able to build properties or um, host properties on that land. But um, he also, the, the, um, there's an example that was posted that said that um, in um, a lot of the slum lands in the global south were um, kind of Western NGOs pushed an idea to convert or to introduce formal deeds of that slum land to create wealth by the slum dwellers, but somehow um, that ended up being that the land um, became kind of uh, aggregated by large landowners. So um, the question is, how will you, how do you think about formalizing this property ownership of this converting the street right of ways into um, private property, how that affects the tenure of existing residents on the streets and kind of a social justice um, viewpoint. Okay. Um, so it's a great point. And I think that there's two places where this might play out. One is um, in more residential neighborhoods where typically there are very few, if any people living on the, 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 the street in these places and the, um, um, especially in single family home neighborhoods, people are <clears throat> pretty quick to, to call the, the police at the, um, the, the first sign of, of anyone living in, in front of their, their property. And so here, if this is the case of kind of privatizing some of this public um, right of way, then that might be a reasonable price to pay and for expanding the overall housing supply. And there's, there's no one really being displaced. Um, the and the people who are, might be living in their vans on the street are often there at the behest of a friend or family member who um, who, who lives there, um, or they're living on someone's driveway in a, in a van. And this is what my, my cousin did until his um, his brother, I think, got sick of him and told him to, to, to move after a while. Um, and then the other place where this might happen, you might think a leasing arrangement would, would be more uh, applicable. Like the, the canals in the UK, then in the Netherlands, that they're not sold off these mooring spots. They're they're rented out um, on a yearly basis, and so the the local government retains the um, the ownership of that lot, and it can um, set whatever lease um, payment it thinks is necessary. Either it, it could even be a dollar if it wants to. Um, really, just provide more housing, or perhaps some places might want to cover their their, their costs. Um, um, but that's really up to the, the city, but it doesn't need to sell off the this, this street to, um, to, to private landowners. Perhaps a, a, maybe a more general question, um, but have you seen any best practices for managing trash at locations with such housing units and, and other general maintenance, such as keeping sidewalks and bicycle lanes uh, clear for people walking and biking. Yeah, there's only a lot of really um, important um, kind of operational and, and, and management issues. And I don't claim to have any expertise uh, on that, um, but so many people are working on housing. They've um, kind of been dealing with this on even off street safe parking zones. There certainly needs to be some um, um, kind of physical trash collection facilities, um, which don't exist right now for people living on the street, which is part of the, the, the problem why it's often seems uh, unkempt and, um, and, and trash lying around. Well, there's, there's no place to put it. Um, but this is also the advantage of a more formalized system that there's um, kind of longer, um, if people are living there a long time, there's more likely to be social norms over kind of trash buildup and so on, um, but also some um, kind of mechanisms to take um, in enforcement action in the same way as if you live in a kind of rental housing, you just like leave your trash like on your doorstep for weeks at a time, um, then your landlord's going to come and um, do something about that up, uh, after a while. Um, so, but again, I, I don't claim to have the, um, the kind of expertise in the kind of management and operational sides of, of facilities like this. All right, um, and the, 
also a more general question. Um, whether, um, where would you see kind of this type of um, formalizing this um, on street camping or extending lots um, into the front setbacks um, be more politically viable? Where do you see um, kind of the consensus building in neighborhoods and how might you envision that to be done? Yeah. yeah so, so on the the expanding streets in lot centers to streets rather. And again, I think the key here is to give homeowners, homeowners or property owners something back in return. And, and they get a larger lot and they can do something with, with that land. And I think that has to be the, um, the kind of a key to gaining some, um, some acceptance. Um, or if it's a, um, a larger kind of redevelopment proposal, say if, um, someone's taking a, if a zoning allows, if there's a single family home and um, a developer wants to build some an apartment building there, then often there's some kind of package of community um, benefits associated, associated with that. And that initially is bundled into the overall politics of that um, proposal. And then for the legalizing um, kind of vans parked on the, the street, I think there's, um, certainly if it's, um, that's most likely to be um, feasible in non-residential neighborhoods, um, just in the same way as this is where um, people who live in their cars and vans typically park right now, um, where they're not um, antagonizing um, anyone who lives on the um, on the street. We see this in kind of quieter places or industrial areas, um, or in places where there's a connection with someone who lives there. Um, so you might imagine, like, hey, if you there's just if there's a residential permit parking, then you can get a permit to um, to park a van on the street. And again, that's happens right now. Um, but typically with the, the blessing of a friend or relative who lives there and they can come in and like use the, the, the bathroom, they kind of use the same garbage pickup and so on. And there's that connection with, with someone who, who lives there. Um, so the short answer, I imagine the kind of the, the larger scale, the kind of communities that I, I shared the image of, of camper vans, that's probably going to be um, non-residential non neighborhoods, so probably the path of least resistance there. Um, but expanding lots into the residential streets, this doesn't have to be at odds at all um, with the, um, the kind of motivations and interests of people who, who, who live there. And wide streets aren't like, good for, for people who um, like, are worried about their kids like dealing with like speeding traffic um, if there's a 50 foot um, right of way. And so coupling the expansion of lots with some street redesign and um, vegetation can actually be a win-win for, um, for, for, for everyone. Great. Uh a question, if you're relying on individual homeowners to choose to add ADUs into street right away, how does it work practically if only one or two homeowners on the street elect to, AD, to add the ADU? How do you main, maintain sidewalk continuity? And do the homeowners have to pay for the street parcel or are they receive it, as, receive it for free as incentive to build ADUs? Um, so the second question, um, first, I, I think it's um, it, it, it's simpler. Uh, it depends. I mean, you might say that there's a one view might be that, hey, this is giving off a city asset, so homeowners should pay for that. The other extreme is that give it homeowners for free because if there's an increase in the supply of, of housing, um, if that's and it's a cheap way to create um, more housing supply. Or there could be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes, and I think I wouldn't want kind of the ability to extract every dollar from people living on that street to be the obstacle, which then means that no one ends up supporting the um, the, the proposal. Um, so, I, in practice, I think some nominal fee um, would, at least to get the concept started, would be more useful. And yeah, not everyone will be doing this at the same time, but I think that consistent streets are really overrated. Like the traffic engineers love to um, kind of present the cross section. This is the, the cross section that's uniform along this whole street. Um, but some of the most interesting streets 
they vary, they narrow down, they, they widen out. Um, there's pockets of parking here, there's, um, um, there's, there's a parking lane here, there's not there. And so from a design point of view, I think it's just fine if a couple of places do it on their own and the street narrows down in one place and then widens out in um, in another. I think that the big challenge that the comment refers to would be maintaining sidewalk connectivity if you have one bit that's a kind of shared surface and one bit that then has sidewalks. But, you know, it's almost, then it almost becomes like a, um, a kind of gateway treatment that, hey, this is a... Um, like a raised surface, like a big speed bump or a speed table that the car goes up on and then you're in the shared area um, and then you go down again. Um, so I think it's, it could certainly work if even just a, a few property owners want to, to do this. Obviously, it would be easier if everyone does it at the same time. Um, but I think the bigger point is that uniformity in a street cross section is an idea that seems to be the norm but i don't understand why it's why anyone cares thank you so another question here um so streets built on a human scale do not necessarily translate to a human scale city so when looking at repurposing residential setbacks and right-of-ways, how may we best introduce a mix of uses to best capitalize on the increased density? And what challenges do commercial developments face under such a scheme? So, so it's a much bigger question about how to can bring mixed uses into residential neighborhoods and actually also into to, to non-residential neighborhoods. And I'm not sure that this is the best place to address that. And it's more about kind of legalizing small scale commercial uses, for example, on, on corner lots um, in particular, that might just be the, the general process of kind of, as buildings age and are renewed, then some of these might um, develop into commercial uses. And, and I think in most, suburban residential neighborhoods, single family home zoning, and there isn't yet the, the kind of density of demand to support a lot of commercial activity. Um, but I think the same principle arise, uh, arises with repurposing street spaces for commercial uses as well. Um, but instead of camper vans, you have food trucks. And those uh, in Portland, right, is the capital of, of, of food trucks. Um, a lot of these on off street parcels um, but why not use the street space for these um, for, for, for food trucks to, to a much greater um, to, to a greater extent? And so introducing um, small scale um, commercial uses, um, a van for a small store or, or food um, would be a great way of recapturing some of the excess street space and turning that into other uses of, um, of urban land. And, and there's been much more acceptance of that, right? Because people, hey, I, I like the food from food trucks. Food trucks are great. They had, um, that, that's the kind of attitude. And so there's been um, less pushback. Um, but I think that the principle is the same. This is a way to blur this line between what is land for, um, um, for a street and what is the land for other urban uses. So perhaps the next step is to say, well, the food truck doesn't have to go away at night. Um, if it's parked on the street, it can just be a semi-permanent um, structure that's just built in the street right of way. Uh, a question on, has the concept been considered for side streets that don't need access points for adjacent lots? Seems it would be easier to put housing on existing right of way in pockets than along frontage roads where consensus would be required for multiple owners and competing demands. Um, can you say that again? Um, so, so side streets? Um, so side streets that don't have access points to property or adjacent lots. Oh, right. ah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that there's lots of, of surplus transportation infrastructure. And so residential streets are one place where just the, the width is typically excessive, but some streets might not be needed at all. Or again, could just be a 16 foot for access 
in order to kind of maintain the connectivity of the, the, the street network. Um, so one wanted to say a kind of general rule that hey, if there's nothing on this street, it's not needed because some of these um, side streets serve a really important role in reducing travel distances for people on foot and bicycle in, in particular. Um, but yeah, these might be the, the places where they're too wide right, um, right, right now. And some or all of the um, right of way could be given over to other uses. Um, and other, even some arterials. And I think there's the US urban areas are littered with these remnant kind of four lane divided arterials, which are really um, underused. And I see this in San Jose, but sometimes the traffic engineers have realized that and tried to um, added a bike lane with this kind of 20 foot buffer. Okay, buffers, bike lanes are nice, but I, I don't need a 20 foot buffer um, painted on the curb. It just illustrates how much of this asphalt is just, um, is just pointless. And so these are the types of streets. Imagine a four lane arterial with a median and perhaps only one half of that is needed for the traffic function. Um, and the other side can be turned into, into new um, parcels, residential um, or otherwise. Um, so yeah, these examples I showed are just one um, type of street where there's this excess asphalt, but there's lots of places where, hey, this land is currently used for transportation, but really doesn't need to be anymore. So um, I guess we're almost out of time, but um, I guess I have one question of my own. I was a little curious about um, whether you had um, presented these ideas in um, some other places, um, especially to other cities. And what I was wondering kind of what was the response of um, you know, cities and planners um, in various places, maybe in California and elsewhere um, with regards to maybe thinking about whether it might work in their particular locations. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's certainly a, a next step and, and not something I'd, I've, I haven't taken this on, on the road and um, or directly got the, um, the, 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 the reactions um, yet. Um, the, the reaction I've got from um, the, the traffic engineers has been somewhat skeptical, I, sh I should say. Um, as, thinking about the well there's a reason for these cross sections right now we spent years developing these cross sections um we, we, we need to keep them but not from the the, the cities so much and um, that's something I, i'd love to do and if there's any um city officials in the um in this webinar um who see this then i'd love to hear from you directly especially if you're interested in trying to try out some of these um the, 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 these ideas um that's definitely a, a really good point and something that's the next step. Chris, you're muted. Almost made it through, huh? With a, well, one of those. So thank you, Adam, for your your presentation, answering all the questions. Um, for the questions that didn't get answered, we will um, forward those on uh, to Adam for his uh, for his viewing. Um, after the seminar ends, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to to take a brief survey. It only takes a few minutes, and we'd we'd appreciate your feedback. If you're a student in the class, uh, we chatted the Zoom link. Uh, if you wanna join us on the Zoom link, if you have any questions about the syllabus or uh, deliverables for the class. And um, as a final uh, note, the, the, Trek, uh, webinar, the Trek webinar series and Friday transportation seminars, you can stay connected by signing up for our newsletter. So with that, thank you very much, Adam. Um, and uh, we'll see so everybody much. next week. Bye-bye.